Thank you everyone for joining us for our August public event. We are really happy to have with us one of our youth members at the Montreal Centre to talk about two weeks at Mount Wilson. Before we get started with that, we like starting all of our events talking a little bit about what we're doing here in Montreal, as well as with a land and sky acknowledgement and a literary reading from our honorary president, David Levy. So I want to start off by just mentioning that today's event is a co-sponsored event by both the RASC Montreal Centre, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and the John Abbott College Space Club. The John Abbott College Space Club is a group of youth interested in space who may or may not be able to take the astronomy or the astrophysics course, but they still get to participate in the partnership with John Abbott and the RASC Montreal Centre. Now, at the moment, we are looking for executive for the Jack Space Club for the coming year. So if you are a John Abbott student and you're watching this presentation and you have an interest in space and astronomy, this is one of the few mentored clubs on campus where you not only have access to amateur astronomers, equipment, facilities beyond the college, but you also have access to experts to come and give talks if you want for whatever activities you do in the club. So if you're interested, you can see Bill Mahone in Student Activities, or you can come and see myself, Kareem Jaffer, uh, Professor in Physics in AME 218. Now, our land and sky acknowledgement for tonight is based on the moon that's starting, because we just had a new moon last night. So I don't even have a crescent moon to show you from, from this morning or from, I guess, really, really late last night, just after sunset, because it was too fine a sliver for myself to take any pictures or any of my friends who I've reached out to. But this new moon that we have starting is the harvest moon for the settlers and for many of the First Nations, because it is a moon that rises as a full moon close to the equinox. So it stays up for long periods of the evening with the rising of the full moon changing much less than it does throughout the rest of the year. Most of the First Nations that don't name it in terms of the harvest or the corn or barley that they would pick out from the, from the fields, they talk about it in terms of the mating of the animals. Uh, in fact, the Cree Nation refers to the scraping of velvet from moose antlers as the rutting moon and the Mi'kmaq directly as the mating moon. So we welcome you all here to the land that uh, we occupy, their unceded indigenous lands here in Montreal from the Mohawk and the Algonquin peoples, but it's different in every part of the world. Now, before I go any further with our Montreal Center, I'm very happy to welcome our honorary president straight from Arizona, David Levy, and I'll ask David to give a welcome and our literary reading for the night. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kareem. It is wonderful to be here. I wouldn't miss a presentation about Wilson, how Wilson for anything. Um, for my poetry reading today, I think everyone at this meeting, <clears throat> whether you're here on Zoom or on a, one of the other platforms, is familiar with John Keats, Chapman's Homer, Seven, much as I traveled to the realms of gold. It is that famous sonnet that he wrote after he spent some time with a friend of his and who introduced John Keats to Chapman's translation of Homer. And they were so upset, they were shouting with delight as to how well Chapman got the translation. They were up the entire night, and as soon as he got home, uh, John Keats wrote the Chapman's Homer sonnet, including the famous line, then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Most of the uh, critics say that that new planet referred to the discovery of Uranus in 1781, but I kind of disagree with that, as I want to do. He wrote the poem in 1816, which was only five years after the Great Comet of 1811. So I think that, um, that actually Keats was referring to the more recent discovery of the Comet of 1811. But anyway, about three weeks ago, I went on a rare clear night here in Arizona for the, in the summertime, I got to look at an area of the sky with NGC 6522. It is possibly the oldest globular star cluster in the sky. It is 12 billion years old, billion with a B and an N. It is really old, very small, but it's obvious to see. 
The reason we can see that cluster at all is it happens to be in an area of the sky where the uh, obscuring dust from star formation, everything else, has opened a window. That window was discovered by Walter Bada in the um, during the Second World War, actually the later 1940s after the war from Mount Wilson, which is kind of where uh, we're going to be going to in a few minutes. <clears throat> and he was very excited about that. Um, and so what I decided to do was to rewrite the John Keats sonnet to pay homage to Walter Bada. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly stars and clusters seen. Round all the celestial islands have I been with eyepiece on telescope to the night sky hold. Off to one wide expanse that I've been told that Galileo ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Bada speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet or a new star cluster swims into his ken. Through his majestic window looks upon the Milky Way, he stared at the center of our galaxy. Like a diamond shining in the sky with a wild surmise silent through the mists of space and time. Thank you and back to you, Curry. That was wonderful, David, and I love the rewrite. Thank you. Thank you. So I will continue a little bit with uh, an introduction for those of you who are joining us for your first time at one of our public events, the RASC Montreal Center. We are over 100 years old. Our national organization is well over 150 now. We are a strong center. We do outreach, we do public events, and we continued throughout COVID to have bi-weekly events. And even now that uh, our COVID pandemic measures are starting to loosen, we are still doing events uh, on Zoom, such as today's talk, as well as in-person events, such as some outreach that we did yesterday. We have a 14-inch telescope at our Bellevue Observatory at the Morgan Arboretum. We have a slightly larger telescope at our Dark Sky site at Woolly Woods that many of our members got to enjoy last night on a rare, clear night on a new moon. I'm a little bit jealous, I have to admit. Uh, we have clubhouses that we hold at the Morgan Arboretum as well as library nights that we hold at John Abbott College at the I.K. Williamson Library. And we have a bi-monthly newsletter, Skyward, which is just phenomenal, made by our editor uh, at the moment. Our editor is Gerald McKenzie, and it's been just an incredible set of materials coming out in Skyward, and all of our members have access to all past issues on our website. Now, at the moment, a lot of us are looking upwards because tomorrow morning we have the launch of the Artemis One mission. And the Artemis One mission is our return to the moon for the first time in almost 50 years. There will be a rocket mission orbiting and then returning to Earth. The CSA has a live feed of the launch if it happens tomorrow morning successfully. NASA has one as well. We will be having one on our Space Oddities show, which I'll tell you about momentarily. But one of the neat things that happened yesterday is we had our outreach at the Aviation Museum. And the education coordinator at the Aviation Museum is a good friend of the center's, Diana Phillips. And she found out two days ago that she was getting a sponsored trip down for the Artemis launch. And so this is her this morning with the Artemis on the pad, SLS set up, waiting behind her, and she is just in heaven. And we are there with her virtually, and we're enjoying her updates as the whole experience continues on. As I mentioned, we have Space Oddities, which is live every Monday at 8 o'clock UK time, 3 o'clock Eastern Daylight time. It's on YouTube, youtube.com slash Space Oddities Live. And we are doing a special show tomorrow earlier to do the launch party with our viewers. But then at that 3 p.m. show, we have a show dedicated to talking about the moon and talking about human, humanity's exploration of the moon. So we welcome you to join us on either of those. But tonight we're really fortunate to have with us our youth member, Elias Jaffer, who had this incredible opportunity in mid to late July to spend two weeks at Mount Wilson. 
Elias has been a member of the Center since 2016. He is an active member of our outreach team, also working with the Science Yourself team with Diana Phillips. He's been a past executive of the John Abbott College Space Club, which is why this is a sponsored event from both of us. And more importantly, in my perspective, he's continuing on in his studies. He's going to University of Ottawa starting in two days. He's getting there to pursue his bachelor's in science in honors physics math. So Ilyas, we are really happy that you're joining us and that you're sharing your experience with us. And I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you so much. So um, before I start, um, uh, I, uh, I'd like to also give a land acknowledgement for the land that Mount Wilson is on, um, which is uh, the land of the Tongva people, which uh, has been lent to the Carnegie Institute for Science for the purposes of doing public uh, science outreach. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so. Uh, thank you for the introduction. You've uh, covered a good part of uh, who I am. Uh, I also currently work as a tutor. Um, and uh, some might remember uh, my first foray into presenting at a RASC public event uh, four, maybe five years ago, was uh, opening for David Levy with the educational music number acknowledged, which you can see me performing here at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. So it's an honor to have uh, David Levy uh, open for me tonight with, uh, with some beautiful poetry. So um, yeah, uh, um, I'd also like to talk a bit about uh, the application process for the uh, for the program. So I went to Mount Wilson as part of the SOAR program, the Summer Observational Astrophysics Retreat. So um, the application process, uh, uh, basically I put in a bunch of uh, like my, my information and then the, uh, um, uh, it was one, uh, uh, one question uh, where I had to put a, a short, short essay answer, and so uh, it's uh, and then I gave a reference, so uh, the contact to a reference. So um, I'd like to thank Professor Caroline Vijay for uh, uh, for writing my reference, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there were. This year there were eight people, uh, sorry, nine people accepted, but uh, one person caught COVID, so wasn't able to come. Um, and uh, uh, um, I've been told that uh, over the the past years they've accepted people uh, uh, as young as eighteen, as old as fifty. So it's really uh, uh, something uh, that that is that, that is uh, accessible, um, and it's it's an amazing opportunity. So. Um, yeah, so let's start with where Mount Wilson is. So in California, uh, you can see where Los Angeles is, um, and Mount Wilson is about here, except it's about a five hour drive. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's not super close to Los Angeles, but it's still close enough. Um, so, um, now I'd like to talk a bit about the history of Mount Wilson. So. Some of you have probably heard of George Ellery Hale, absolute superstar. So um, George Ellery Hale's father uh, made a fortune selling elevators. And so uh, uh, George Ellery Hale, when he was young, he had this microscope, which spurred his uh, his passion in optics. And, um, and oh my gosh, he, he, he's done so many cool things. So um, uh, uh, he's, he's founded many observatories. Uh, he's built many largest telescopes. Uh, he, he built the largest refractor, uh, which is a 40 inch at Yerkes. Then he built the largest six, uh, the largest reflector at the time, which was a 60 inch on Mount, at Mount Wilson. And then the largest reflector at the time, which was a hundred inch at Mount Wilson, and then planned to build a 300 inch at Mount Palomar, which is a little further away in uh, California. Um, but then that had to be downsized and uh, to a 200 inch and that got completed after his passing. But, oh my gosh, this absolute superstar. Um, and then in, uh, in uh, 1908, he discovered uh, that, uh, 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 that sunspots had magnetic fields through looking at their spectra and seeing what's called Zeeman splitting. Um, and 
also discovered that the polarity changes every four-ish years. And so that's like, that's now got his name, Hale's Law, which is really cool. Um, and then here on the right, you see a picture of uh, Hale with Andrew Carnegie. So Andrew Carnegie, you might have heard his name before because he's his name is kind of everywhere, but uh, he's basically, um, uh, I don't remember exactly how he made his fortune, but he, he was very, very, very uh, rich man and he, he sponsored a lot of arts and sciences. So he, um, uh, he's the one who, uh, who uh, sponsored the, the, the creation of Mount Wilson. Uh, uh, I believe, I don't remember the exact year, but uh, the, the, the site for Mount Wilson was leased to the uh, Carnegie Institute for Science for 99 years for, uh, uh, for the purposes of, uh, I think, uh, science research and outreach. And um, since then, I think the agreement is that uh, so long as they keep doing public outreach, they can keep the equipment there. Um, and so right now it's being operated by the Mount Wilson Institute, um, which is run by uh, Tom Meneghini. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's pretty cool, I think. Um, why isn't it moving to the next slide? Sorry, give me a quick second. Ah, uh, there. So this is the map of the Mount Wilson Observatory that I uh, had on the back of the notebook that they gave me uh, when I arrived. So over here, you have the monastery. Here you have the 16 inch dome, which we used uh, uh, often for, uh, uh, for our uh, nightly observing sessions. Uh, here, there's the library where we had our lectures and did a lot of our data processing on the computers there. Uh, it was also a, a big hangout spot. Um, then over here, you have uh, the Snow Solar Telescope. Yes, this is where uh, we did the solar observing in the mornings. That, that was a lot of fun. Over here, we have the museum. And what I found really cool is in the museum, they actually have a tribute to, Com to Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. And we have uh, one of the discoverers here in the Zoom right now. Um, here, uh, oh, where did my mouse go? Right here. Uh, we have the 150 foot solar tower, uh, which uh, I will go into more detail about later. Here we have the 60 inch telescopes dome. And here we have the big uh, Kara interferometer which uh, I didn't get to really see, so I'm, I don't really know much about it, so I won't be able to speak much about that tonight. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I mean, if you want to know more about it, uh, might want to visit Mount Wilson at some point. Uh, here, there's the 100-inch uh, uh, dome, and uh, over here, you see Path to Echo Rock. I'll be talking about Echo Rock a bit more later, um, but uh, yeah, there's also a bunch of uh, private residences here, so um, uh, M Mount Wilson is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not small. Uh, and a lot of these treks are uphill <laughs> and they kind of feel uphill both ways, even though it's, <laughs> uh, so it's like, you get quite a workout, uh, just getting, getting around. Um, so, uh, let's start by looking at the 150 foot solar tower. So, um, uh, we have the, uh, tower which has uh, a bunch of uh, lens lenses on top and then at the uh, which um, I, I believe uh, are uh, set manually in the mornings and then uh, there's more lenses at the bottom here that are controlled uh, 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 electronically but using remotes um, and then so this is uh, a, a screen where you can kind of see the the projection, uh, and so here we can see the sunspots that were uh, that were there when uh, when I was there. Um, and here you can also see two scale models. So if this is this is the 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 size of the sun, this tiny bead over here that is the Earth. So if you compare that to the sunspot, yikes! And this is Jupiter. And what you see on this card over here is the largest sunspot ever recorded. Um, I don't remember the exact year, I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the largest sunspot recorded since we've started measuring. Um, also, if you remember, I talked about Hale's Law a few slides ago. Um, uh, if you go to the 150 foot solar tower on the walls, they have these uh, graphs because they've been monitoring for, for a long time, 
the uh, different characteristics of the sun, you'll be able to see graphs where you can see the polarity of the magnetic fields flipping every four or so years, which I found really cool. Um, then there's the Snow Solar Telescope. So these two mirrors over here, oh, uh, these two mirrors over here are just flat mirrors. They're to direct the light of the sun towards the primary mirror over here. Now this primary mirror over here, you might notice it doesn't seem as bright as you'd expect. That's because we've got this little ring on top, which you can see better here, to limit the amount of light uh, going through. Sometimes we put that on, sometimes we don't. There's a reason for that, which uh, I'll cover uh, a bit later, uh, that in this specific case we have it on. Uh, and then it points to this uh, uh, secondary mirror, which brings it down to, uh, to uh, basically wherever we choose our focal point to be. So here we had this uh, 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 little disc where we basically put a sheet of paper. So we, we kept the limiter so that we wouldn't burn the sheet of paper immediately. Um, but uh, lower down here, you also have the uh, spectroscope. And uh, there's also, you can't see, but behind there, there's a little hatch and there's uh, there's like a ladder and a tunnel going down. I can't remember if it was 12 feet or 20 feet, but it augments the spectroscope's focal length by like 24 or 40 feet. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's pretty cool. We, they they have a solar spectroscope, and you can just uh, see it as is as well. Um, then we have the sixty inch reflector. So at the time, this was the largest uh, uh, largest reflector when it was built, um, and uh, you can see here the uh, the mirror uh, uh, as it's being shown. Uh, so the the mirrors are usually glass that's coated, used to be coated by silver, now is coated by aluminum because aluminum takes longer to oxidize. Um, and uh, before when they used silver, every few weeks they would have to take the mirror off, do a whole treatment with like hydrochloric acid and stuff, and uh, then put a whole new coating of, uh, of silver. It was quite, it was, it was quite the process. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see here, there's a ton of uh, counterweights to balance this ginormous telescope uh, and uh, a giant gear to make sure that, it, uh, that it's running uh, 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 properly. Back here is the control panel where, where, uh, uh, where everything was controlled from. And uh, yeah, I, I got the chance to, uh, to uh, push some buttons uh, guided by uh, by uh, Tom Meneghini, uh, director of the Mount Wilson Institute. So that was that, that was quite fun. Um, then this is the 100 inch dome. Uh, once again, the largest at its time. You can see here the ramp where this uh, famous picture with uh, uh, Einstein was taken at Mount Wilson. Um, here I'm standing on the, uh, uh, the railing outside, uh, outside the dome, uh, which you can see up here. Um, here you can also see the large gear for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, 100 inch, and you can see the spectrograph here. Um, now, beyond this gear, there's a room, and you might be able to see a small circle under the, or not a small circle, but a faint circle under the uh, telescope. Um, that was, so past this gear uh, is the chamber where the uh, mirror would be lowered to get uh, re-silvered, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, they, uh, both the 60-inch and the 100-inch dome, if I'm not mistaken, are able to be rented out uh, to the public for, uh, for like, uh, uh, for events. Um, and uh, 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 they also have uh, these events, like these Sunday afternoon concerts in the dome, which they have uh, about once a month. Uh, this is the upcoming one. The, the, the next one is going to be on September 4th, where they're going to have jazz performers, which is pretty cool. Um, so, uh, uh, oh yeah. Um, uh, so when these telescopes were first built, we didn't have uh, CCD cameras uh, to take the pictures. Uh, um, so what, what we had instead were these photographic plates, which I think with, I think, uh, silver nitrate or something like that. And uh, you'd have to go like all the way up here, which is why you see this really steep, precarious looking ladder. Um, so uh, for example, if you wanted to take a picture of a really dim object, 
an astronomer would have to sit in there for like four straight nights and make sure that the star was on the exact same point of the photographic plate for the entire night. So yeah, being an astronomer back then was was quite the job. Um, yeah, you, you got to have that fortitude. Um, uh, yes, uh, so Mount Wilson, one of the things that it's really known for is the discovery of the expansion of the universe. Um, so um, uh, Ed Edwin Hubble is credited with the discovery. Uh, he worked with uh, Milton Humason, who did the uh, uh, who, who did the observations. Uh, Humason started as a uh, uh, as a mule man uh, carrying the stuff up to Mount Wilson, and uh, had an interest in the uh, in the instrumentation, uh, and basically worked his way up into being an astronomer, despite having no formal training at uh, at an institution, um, and. This discovery was based on uh, on a few things. The work of uh, Henrietta uh, Leavitt, uh, who uh, made the uh, uh, really big discovery about the uh, uh, correlation between Ceph uh, Cepheid variable stars, period, and their brightness. So you can use that to determine the distance. Um, and uh, also Vesto Slipher uh, documented uh, the redshift in many objects, but could not measure the distance to them due to the telescope limitations. So Hubble, uh, expanded on that um, and uh, uh, basically found that the, that there was a correlation between uh, how far an object is and how much redshift you expect. Now, Hubble initially estimated the Hubble constant at about 558, but by then, uh, type 2 Cepheid variables were not known, and uh, current estimates range between maybe 65 and 72, I think. Um, now, uh, so from this great discovery, many, uh, 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 many esteemed, uh, uh physicists, uh, and, uh, ha have come, uh, visit. So here you can see Albert Einstein and also, uh, Albert Michelson, uh, which is the same Michelson from the famous Michelson-Morley ex uh, experiment. Uh, and, uh, Albert Michelson also used, uh, Mount Wilson uh, back in 1926 uh, to measure the speed of light by measuring how f uh, uh, the time uh, between a, a pulse of light going from Mount Wilson to another mountain, I think called Mount St. Gabriel, about 22 miles away and back. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, now uh, let's get into the, the, the uh, living spaces. So this is the monastery. It was called the monastery because women used to not be allowed here. Um, this room over here at the front is uh, the, the kitchen, and here, uh, right behind this little antechamber, there's the cook's room, which is the only room in the monastery that has its own washroom, because it's not near the other rooms. Um, uh, and behind there, you have the, uh, the rooms that are uh, being left untouched, being left as they were at the time when Hubble was here. So uh, here you have a... a a uh, picture of uh, of one of those two rooms. Um, you've got a whole bunch of uh, uh, old books. Uh, re really, uh, they, they've they, like the sorry. Uh, there's uh, a whole bunch of scientific uh, uh, literature, but there's also a bunch of uh, uh, literature. And uh, we were also surprised to see that there were a few uh, 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 a few exotic novels as well. Some uh, Japanese literature. Some some Spanish literature. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, here, you, you it, with the quality of the picture, you might not be able to see, but there's a picture of a bunch of, uh, uh, of a bunch of esteemed scientists, including Albert Einstein, sitting on these very chairs, uh, which you can see in these pictures. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, Mount Wilson, uh, since 2015, is currently expect, uh, experiencing the worst drought that it has since, uh, since recorded history. Uh, and um, it, basically, it uh, it has the water carted up by uh, by large trucks, and so uh, 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 there's water saving measures that are being implemented uh, in the monastery. Uh, so that's something to be wary of uh, if if you go visit. Um, and two years ago, there was uh, the uh, bobcat wildfire, uh, which came 
dangerously close to Mount Wilson, and I think singed uh, part of uh, one of the buildings, uh, sorry, uh, of the monastery, uh, sorry, singed part of the monastery, but uh, uh, the, the, the damage, I think, was minimal, and the, uh, sorry, the damage was minimal, and the uh, firefighters did a great job, but you can still see around here, like, a bunch of dead vegetation, uh, and uh, a lot of just uh, young vegetation growing from where a lot of stuff burnt down. So it's it's a very interesting sight to, to, to behold. Uh, now, Mount Wilson also has a lot of interesting wildlife. Uh, we got to see some interesting birds, some deer, uh, got to hear some owls. There's lizards absolutely everywhere. Uh, if, if, if you're walking uh, and you're lost in your thoughts, you'll get brought back to reality by the sound of a lizard scuttling away from you. Um, however, uh, we also carried our flashlights everywhere with us because at night um, you never know where a rattlesnake might be and you don't want to step on one and make one angry. So uh, that was a uh, uh, definite thing to be careful of. Uh, also uh, uh, looking out for uh, mountain lions. Uh, so um, th those were all, uh, th thankfully we didn't see any. Uh, I think one of my friends said he saw a bobcat. Um, uh, I, uh, that, that's pretty cool. Um, then, uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, the, the schedule. So it's, it's kind of packed. Uh, if you can see there's three timings for the solar and the stellar observing, that's because we were divided into three groups, uh, uh, shuffled up every time, an early, a middle, and a late group, just, uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, it wasn't cluttered and that everyone could try everything. Um, so we had solar observing in the morning and, uh, uh, observing on the 16 inch at night. Um, and then we had uh, some classes uh, where we uh, learned really interesting concepts about, uh, sorry, about the, uh, 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 about the stuff we were seeing and about, um, uh, and we got to do some image processing and how to do, uh, how, how to do all that image processing. It was uh, quite a lot of fun. And then the second week uh, was uh, reserved for doing a project. So, um, uh, on Saturday, we wrote our proposals and submitted them, and then uh, uh, and then did our uh, our projects on the second week. So, um, uh, I'd like to talk to you about a few of the library topics that I found uh, uh, quite interesting. So, um, air mass uh, that is a measure of how much air there is between you, like of the of the Earth's air there is between you and the star that you're taking a look at. So if you're looking directly upwards, that's one air mass. Now, if you're looking a bit to the side, well, you'll be going through a little bit more air. Now, because uh, uh, the Earth is so big, we approximate uh, it to be flat. And so we can kind of approximate uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, air mass uh, by just using a right angle triangle. Uh, and so, um, we try to aim not to look at anything over two air mass because then we get a lot of uh, 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 imprecision. Uh, and so, uh, using this approximation, we we don't we don't really go past sixty degrees. Um, now, uh, what there's also a concept called seeing, uh, which is uh, how because the air isn't still, turbulence will affect the light, which is getting refracted through it. Uh, and so a star uh, might appear to take up more of the sky on a long exposure than it actually does. Now, if you take a bunch of these short exposures, uh, sorry, if you take a bunch of short exposures, you, the, the, it kind of looked to be moving all over the place. But then if you use uh, Fourier analysis, um, uh, you can glean information about the structure of the star, uh, uh, which, and that's called speckle, inter speckle interferometry. Um, now, uh, another thing we can do with the light is we can, uh, we can separate it into all the colors, into a spectrum. And when we do that, we can see a bunch of absorption lines, which tell us about what's at the surface of that star, because what's at the surface of that star is going to absorb some wavelengths of light. Um, and so, um, uh, those those specific wavelengths are indicative of certain elements. Um, so there's uh, different spectral classes of stars that have been defined. Uh, um, originally, 
um, the, the, like the earlier the letter in the alphabet, it meant uh, the stronger the strength of the hydrogen lines. Um, and we thought that that correlated to temperature, but then uh, later we realized that that's not exactly true. Uh, and so now if we go sorting them by temperature, uh, the order of the uh, uh, of them now goes, and there's a really fun mnemonic they, they, uh, they taught us over there. Only bumbling astronomers forget generally known mnemonics like this. LTR sometimes forgotten, but uh, yeah, I, I found that, uh, that mnemonic to be quite fun. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I, I found those topics quite interesting. Uh, can I move on to the next slide? Now, in the solar observing in the morning, uh, uh, got to do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, got to uh, uh, try to do some sunspot sketching, which was quite cool. First through that paper that I told you about. And then we looked uh, through a telescope with a uh, uh, hydrogen alpha filter. Um, so here you can see my sketches. Um, and then we also learned about blazing. So normally when, you, when you're when you dividing light into the different colors, um, you use a diffraction grating, which has a bunch of, uh, just a, a bunch of little slits with uh, certain separations, which, which make the light, uh, sorry, it's a bit uh, difficult to explain, but uh, basically it, it, it it makes different wavelengths deviate at different angles. And so uh, uh, at the center, you'll, you'll just have all the wavelengths, but then uh, what's called first order is gonna be your first spectrum, you'll see. Um, and what happens is usually when you go to later spectra, you get less and less light because it's more and more spread out. And so it's dimmer. But when you're blazing, what you do is instead you take the slits and you angle them a little bit so that a later order will appear brighter. Um, and so that can be used to get more detail. And uh, I think the, uh, the uh, diffraction grading on the Snow Solar Telescope is blazed at fourth order. So you can see a lot of uh, detail there, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, also, um, there's, uh, uh, there's certain angles uh, that, uh, uh, that can tell you about, uh, uh, so the, 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 the P angle is basically, uh, uh, an angle that tells you about the the, uh, the, the tilt of the sun uh, uh, on how you're trying to measure the rotation, I think, so that uh, you can apply corrections when you're trying to uh, uh, use the Doppler shift from one side of the sun to the other to uh, measure its rotation. Um, and then uh, also sometimes when you're taking a uh, uh, picture of the sun, you'll want to take a flat field, which is when instead of uh, pointing it at the sun, you point it just at the sky so that you um, uh, you get the ambient light so that you can subtract that from your picture of the sun. Um, now, the 16-inch uh, that we used uh, during the night, uh, this is a picture from an earlier year, so you can see what the dome looks like. Um, it was a is called a catadioptric, so it, it's not a refractor, a refractor uh, sorry, a refractor or a reflector, it's both. So it has a, a spherical mirror, but it has a lens that makes it act like a parabolic mirror, so it focuses on one point. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, right ascension is a, 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 a number that's uh, associated with a, a star or an object that uh, uh, tells you basically what time it's going to be at, uh, at your, uh, uh, at, uh, sorry, it, uh, what time is gonna be directly overhead. Um, and uh, so you could think of it like, uh, uh, like longitude and declination as like latitude for the sky. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, uh, so when you're using uh, the CCD camera, uh, uh, I, I think this is pretty cool. Uh, uh, you need to make sure that your exposure time is not too long because what happens is the energy of the waveform that hits the CCD can, uh, can get too great. And then what happens is it quantum tunnels into the next pixel over uh, even though it shouldn't. And so you need to make sure to keep your exposure down and then you can stack it later uh, because otherwise you could get uh, some uh, uh, er erroneous uh, 
uh, signal. And uh, so when we're focusing, we do some coarse focus uh, uh, with, with our eyes. Uh, one thing to uh, be careful of uh, with, with this specific telescope is because there's gears, there's backlash. So you always want to be turning the same way. So if you overshoot, you have to overshoot the other way and then recorrect. So in for this specific telescope, we always turn clockwise. Um, However, for the fine focus, it's a friction drive. So there's no backlash. Uh, so we, we use an electronic controller. And uh, so the focus number um, uh, 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 is something that, that we, we, so we basically try different focus numbers. We take three exposures to see um, what the half, uh, sorry, full width half max is. Um, and then we try to minimize that. But what is a full width half max? So uh, what we do, is we take the peak brightness, we take half that, and we see what is the, the deviation there. So at half maximum, what is the full uh, width uh, of, uh, uh, of the peak? And so using that, by minimizing that, you, you know that you're, you're focused properly on the, uh, uh, on the star. So, uh, uh, I found that pretty cool. Like here, you can see one of the full width half max uh, 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 curves. Um, uh, so, for example, when we were doing the RGB uh, uh, filters, uh, one thing that we found was that the blue and green filters had about the same focus value, but the red had a focus value about 150 uh, focus number higher than the other two. So we just had to correct that when we were doing our, me our measurements um, uh, to make sure that we were focused. Um, now, part of the experience, we also had outings to uh, the La Brea Tar Pits and the Griffith Observatory. The Griffith Observatory is uh, um, uh, is basically like a, a an a astronomy museum. Uh, they've they've got a, a bunch of exhibits on the ground floor and on the basement as well, which we didn't discover until a bit too late. And so, a lot of us didn't get to explore that. Uh, fully, but so make sure that you get to see that as well. Uh, they have a giant Foucault pendulum that's going and they have a bunch of uh, pegs there so you can see it knock them down about seven minutes at a time. Um, uh, and they have a, a telescope on the roof that uh, you can go see during the day, uh, but it's not open, uh, but it opens up at night uh, for, for uh, observing, which uh, I think is pretty cool. Uh, also, the uh, La Brea tar pits, uh, they, uh, it's not actually tar, but it's, uh, it's uh, some uh, substance that uh, uh, conserves fossils really well. And so um, uh, th we, we have a really good archaeological record of ancient California, thanks to uh, uh, La Brea uh, tar pits. Um, now, uh, uh, during... Uh, uh, during the time I was at Mount Wilson, uh, 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 so I was at Mount Wilson from July 17th to uh, July 31st, and my birthday uh, is on July 20th. And on July 20th, we were scheduled to go observe through the 60 inch. So I had the best birthday ever. We got to see so many interesting objects. Uh, here you can see pictures of some of them. Oh my gosh, it was such a phenomenal experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I now have a new favorite object in the night sky, which is uh, Campbell's hydrogen star. Um, if, if you ever get the chance to see it, you should. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely amazing. Um, one other thing that we got to see is uh, a sunset through the 150 foot solar tower. So um, here I'll show a, a 40 second time lapse uh, taken by uh, uh, another one of the participants, Cole. Sometimes you see us pointing, it's because uh, an aircraft is visible through, uh, 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 through casting a shadow on the, on the sun. Well, not casting a shadow on the sun, but blocking some of the sun's light.
Okay, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the uh, uh, and because the solar tower follows the sun, it looks like the the ground comes up and swallows it up. Uh, that, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, we got a. Uh, uh, it's amazing scenery, so I made sure to wake up to see some uh, some of the beautiful sunrises and some of the sunsets. Um, here you can see Echo Rock, which I said I would be talking about uh, again. This was my go-to uh, sunrise spot, um, and the different weather conditions made uh, like uh, e each uh, each sunrise uh, quite different. Like here, you can see it kind of looks like the clouds are like a, a fog. Uh, or, or almost like like water rolling over the uh, uh, rolling over the mountains, uh, and sometimes it was so clear you could see the city below. It was just really nice experience. Um, and here uh, you can see the sunset from the uh, uh, railing around the hundred inch. So let's move on to the night at the hundred inch. Um, so um, at the hundred inch. Um, uh, I've already talked about the uh, silvering room, uh, but here you can also see their uh, clock drive. So the uh, uh, before it all got uh, uh, switched to electronics, which mind you, uh, the electronics were all wired by hand by volunteers over the course of I think years uh, or over a year for sure, um, um, and uh, uh, they were using this clock drive. And even now, as it is, they could just hook it up back to the clock drive uh, uh, with with because uh, it's it's still compatible. Uh, so uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, uh, oh yeah, also um, I forgot to mention this earlier. The mirror for the sixty inch was uh, gifted by Hale's father, um, but the mirror for the hundred inch uh, was custom made. Now the only people who had the facilities to make such a big mirror at the time were winemakers in France. Uh, to, to deal with so much glass. So um, there were seven attempts at the pour. The attempt that's currently in is the second attempt. Why then were there third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh attempts? Well, the second attempt was initially rejected because of bubbles. The person who was going to carve the, uh, uh, who's going to like polish and uh, uh, polish the, uh, the the mirror to make the curve uh, said that th these bubbles are too much of a risk. If he runs into a pocket, it'll create a, a divot, and then it's it's not going to be nice. Except all five others shattered because they didn't have good structural integrity. The bubbles were keeping this stable. Um, so yeah, I think that that's that's pretty cool. Um, uh, also, this telescope. Uh, currently has mercury in it. Uh, that's part of the mechanism. So it's maybe not up to code, but it's it, it's the technology of the time. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, and it 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 works amazingly. You see beautifully. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing that that I found scary was uh, uh, Tom Meneghini climbed in there to uncover the mirror like he he he, he had to climb up go inside the telescope uh gosh darn that's uh yeah um uh oh yeah also we got to go uh uh, uh, uh downstairs and see uh all of the other stuff um uh like the past equipment that they were using and uh the the cranes how they used to carry the mirror, how they used to transport the mirror, they're carrying it just by friction. Like they would clamp around it, nothing underneath, and they would just use friction to lift that heavy, heavy mirror to where it needed to go. Uh, yeah. I don't know, I, 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 I found that pretty, pretty wild. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that clock drive is uh, similar to the one in the snow. Um, uh, Oh yeah, I forgot to mention about the Snow Solar Telescope. Um, those, uh, or am I mentioning it later? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, so the Snow Solar Telescope, um, uh, those first two, uh, those first two mirrors, uh, we we move them manually. Uh, like there's there's a bunch of cranks and ev everything is done manually, which I found pretty cool, uh, including starting up the clock drive. And that clock drive uh, is uh, uh, similar to this one. Uh, so I. I, I Found that pretty cool. Um, uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, now we get to uh, 
to the project that I spent the second week working on. So um, uh, the equipment that I used, I used the 16 inch that I showed you earlier, along with this spectrograph, or not this exact spectrograph, but a spectrograph of this make, uh, as well as a CCD uh, imaging camera with this, uh, uh, with this uh, specification. Um, now, uh, in order to, so for my project, basically what I was trying to do was I was looking at uh, cooler stars. Um, so, I mean, relatively cooler, you still can't touch them, um, but uh, 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 the basically cooler stars, um, they have a bit less energy. And so molecules can form. They don't get broken up immediately. So uh, what I was looking for was traces of some of the molecules that, uh, uh, or one of the specific molecules that's quite abundant in cooler stars, which is titanium oxide. Now, in order to do this, I was going to take the spectrum, but I also have to do two other things first. I need to take a dark, uh, 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 I need to take a dark, and I need to take a lamp before and after. Now, let's talk about a dark. So when you take a dark, you cover the telescope, and then you take uh, an exposure of however long you're going to be taking the exposure of the star for. Um, now, the reason you do this is so uh, any hot pixels on the CCD, uh, any defects in the camera itself, you can then subtract out. A lamp uh, is when you once again cover the telescope, but then you, uh, 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 you change the input of, this, uh, uh, of the CCD. Uh, sorry, you don't cover the telescope. You, you yes, you cover the telescope, but you... you Basically, you use a, a, a lamp um, that only has, uh, so for this specific case, we use mercury and argon. Uh, so we excite the mercury and argon so that they only let off certain, uh, sorry, certain uh, wavelengths, which are the characteristic wavelengths of mercury and argon. And then we can use those to uh, uh, where they appear on the image to calibrate the spectra that we get later on. Uh, so, uh, once I get those lamps, I do something called blinking, which means I take the image from the lamp from before and the lamp from after, and I make the computer show them to me, uh, switching between each other at here uh, a quarter second. The reason I do this is so I can see just with my eye if there's been any big deviation, and if so, if I may need to take that bias into account. Then what I do is uh, I identify those uh, mercury argon uh, lines. So uh, well, what I did here is uh, uh, I uh, took the, uh, sorry, I took the uh, peak pixel um, and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, did I use the peak pixel? No, I didn't use the peak pixel. What I did instead is I took the peak pixel's peak, uh, peak brightness and then, uh, I did, uh, I used one tenth of that as my threshold to uh, get uh, all of the ones about around and uh, then did the centroid of those, uh, which is like a weighted average so that I can get a more precise image of where the center of that line was. Then using those data from the before and after lamps uh, and using their known values and wavelengths, um, I, uh, I did a uh, linear regression to get uh, a formula that I can then apply to get, uh, to convert from pixel to wavelength. That way, when I use my actual spectrum, uh, I can switch uh, the pixel data into wavelength information and get uh, uh, and find the wavelengths that I'm looking for. So, this is one of the spectra of one of the stars that, that I'm looking at. Uh, and this is what happens after I combine all of the, my different exposures together. Now, you might think, yikes, this is quite spread out. Aren't I going to have a problem with this? Nope, because I'm going to sum it by columns. And the reason I do this is because uh, each column uh, is uh, uh, corresponds to, to uh, the... So each vertical line is basically uh, one wavelength. So uh, it's okay if I sum it by columns. And once I sum it by columns, uh, 
I can put it into an Excel spreadsheet and have, sorry, my, uh, my brightness information. Now, here, what I'm doing is something called the instrument response curve. So when you have light from a star coming in, the light from the star uh, won't be, uh, sorry, the, the light from the star is going to uh, 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 go through the atmosphere, but we don't really care about that. But then it's going to go through the instrument. And the instrument has a certain bias uh, towards certain uh, wavelengths. And so it's going to, so the signal that you receive is not going to be what the star emitted. So what we have to do is take the, uh, uh, so take the spectrum of a star with a known spectrum and then divide that by its known spectrum to get, uh, to get the uh, instrument's bias. And you can see that once we've got that bias, there's still a few, uh, sorry, uh, so this is, uh, sorry, um, did not using the mouse uh, here. Let's use the mouse. So this is the, the spectrum. This is uh, once, uh, uh, sorry, what am I doing? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is the spectrum. Here I'm choosing its known spectrum so I can divide by it. Here you've got it once I've divided, but you see it's not a smooth curve. That's because of that pesky atmosphere of the earth that is introducing these telluric lines, which is what we call the lines from the absorption from uh, whatever's in our Earth's air. So we just smooth that out uh, to take away the little extraneous peaks. And then we got our instrument response curve. Now, what we do with this instrument response curve is then we can divide our, uh, then we can divide uh, our spectra for the stars we're looking at uh, by the instrument response to get a corrected spectrum. Um, and here, this uh, this is because that's the limit of what we were looking at. But that's okay. What what we're looking for is part of what's here. So um, that that's fine. Uh, so basically, um, I can disregard everything uh, from here on outwards. Um, but uh, yeah, it gives us a corrected spectrum so that uh, it removes the bias from the instrument. Now, uh, then. I needed to choose which specific wavelengths for the titanium oxide I'm gonna look for. Now, the difficulty with, with uh, a molecule is that you don't get a line. You get a band because a molecule has a bunch of different like uh, electron configurations and it's, com it's complicated, it's dynamic. Um, so what, what we look for instead is a band head. So that is the start of the band and we're looking for the most drastic drop. So. I chose to focus on these two band heads. Uh, one of these is near 5,000 angstroms-ish, and one of them is near, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, 5,175 angstroms-ish. An angstrom is a 10th of a nanometer. Uh, to, to be clear, it's uh, 10 to the negative 10 meters. Um, so uh, here uh, are the five curves we got for the five stars. Um, remember I was talking about uh, the mnemonic, so M, uh, M stars are cooler than K stars, right? Known mnemonics. And then these numbers as well, uh, the, uh, the higher the number, the, the cooler the star. So Arcturus, uh, Arcturus here is the hottest star on the bottom. And uh, 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 V1351 Cygni uh, is the coolest star, which is on the top. And you can see on these graphs, it does seem as though the cooler stars have more pronounced drops. But qualitative is not enough, so we had to go at it quantitatively. So what I did, oh, hello, there. Um, I used uh, Excel to take the top and the bottom of each drop, and then I did their quotient. I divided the the top by the bottom to get uh, by how much it uh, it decreased, and uh, and uh, uh, and th and then I plotted those on a graph. So uh, a, a previous study uh, uh, done in the uh, um, uh, American Association for uh, Variable Star Observers um, uh, uh, concluded that uh, when a temperature of a given star is cooler the opacity of titanium oxide increases, and so titanium uh, oxide absorption bands are more prominent. 
Um, so uh, my graphs show indeed the correlation that we were expecting that we saw from the uh, from the earlier experiments. And so um, I deem my project to be a success. Um, and yeah, so that that was that was quite a fun experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to extend uh, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Paula Turner, uh, Robert Buchheim was here with us today, uh, John Hoot, Patricia Hill, uh, Thomas Meneghini, uh, Caroline Viget, and to Rask Montreal for uh, uh, well, for getting me uh, into this whole circle of uh, and this rabbit hole of astronomy that I'm absolutely loving. So uh, yeah, uh, that 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 concludes my talk uh, and. Uh, yeah, I guess now we can go to open discussion. That was wonderful, Ilyas. And I'm not just saying that as the host and public events coordinator, but also as a very proud papa. That was that was fantastic. Uh, Emily uh, wrote uh, in the chat that she's jealous of your birthday celebrations. Uh, Eric Briggs mentioned that he had gone in 2002 and that it seems like the program is just as amazing now as it was then. Yeah, it um, used to be called Curia. Yes, Curia, yeah. And you have you still have the software from the program now, right? You have access yes. to this. Yes, I, I have it on my I have it on my computer because most of the software is written by John Hoot. And so uh uh yeah, he he um uh, he helped me install the virtual machine on my computer, and uh, yeah, uh, so now if I get any more data, I can just pop it onto my computer and process it. we fun. Oh, that's wonderful. So let's open it up. Any questions? Any discussion? Yes, um, I had a question about the solar tower. How exactly does that work? Uh, I'm not quite certain. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite certain. I think the reason for it to be 150 feet is just to have a, large, uh, a longer focal length. Um, uh, but uh, I'm not quite certain. Uh, uh, Bob, do you know? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, summary. Um, the, the idea is way up at the top of the tower, there's a coelostat that collects the sunlight and sends it straight down through uh, a very long focal length objective lens, making an image of the sun on the observing table. Uh, the instrument is primarily was uh, primarily created to be a spectrograph. So put your slit on the uh, image of the sun and say, let's only let light from a, a sunspot pass through, continues down into this well below ground level uh, to where the um, uh, uh, collimator and grating are housed. And so back up at the observing table, you see the spectrum of the thin slice of the sun you're looking at. A uh, couple of reasons for the huge tower. Part of it is focal length, as Ilya said. The other part was get above the ground seeing so you have better resolution in that solar image. And the reason that the diffraction grating is way down at the bottom of a well is thermal stability. The temperature never changed down there at the bottom of the well. So very clever design in, what was it, 1904, I think, that that uh, solar tower went up. That's wonderful. Uh, Eric Briggs was asking if, uh, Elias, if you took the elevator to the top of the tower, or Bob, if you could talk about the view from the top. Um, I have not been to the top of the 150, the, I think it's 60 or 80 foot solar tower. Uh, I've been to the top of, nobody's allowed to ride the cage anymore. That is so far out of the realm of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the United States. Only the, the uh, couple of authorized operators can, but you can uh, climb up uh, a ladder to the top of the 60 foot solar tower. And it's a beautiful view uh, and frankly terrifying because you're on this little teeny platform way up in the air. <laughs> That sounds uh, definitely terrifying. Yeah, this the sixty foot is the one right beside the Snow Solar Telescope, right? Correct. Yeah, uh, I think we saw that on the map. Uh, yeah, I think Michael. Yeah, hi there. I mean, I 
uh, great uh, talk. Um, you, you, you definitely definitely got the enthusiasm with you. So brilliant. Um, you, when you were talking about the um, the cat, the, when the astronomer used to have to go up into the cage, uh, I remember um, uh, astronomer David Maylin from the Anglo-Australian Telescope um, in, in a talk that he did, uh, actually talking about working in the cage um, all night, as he said, uh, taking the photographic plates at the time. Uh, I've actually found uh, an article online, uh, which I put in the chat, uh, which has got a photograph of um, David actually in the um, in the cage itself. Oh, nice! Uh, yeah, when preparing my presentation, I was uh, I, I I was, you know, like uh, I was a bit frustrated that I didn't take a picture of uh, that picture that they yeah. had uh, at the hundred inch of Hummerson in the uh, hundred inch. Yeah, so I understand the, the, the plates themselves were about. Um, um, the uh, 12 inches square, something like that, or even bigger. Uh, I don't remember inches. the size, but uh, yeah. 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 Uh. Oh, wonderful. And uh, uh, several people uh, echoed what Michael said there about your enthusiasm coming out. Uh, Maury and Trevor both mentioned, as did uh, Sharifa, how, how energetic and enthusiastic you were you know the amount that they crammed into those two weeks that you've been able to share with us tonight has been has been incredible oh there's there's too much i had to cut <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do a part two then another another hour perhaps <laughs> perhaps <laughs> look, look forward uh, to it <laughs> are there any other questions before we open up to a general discussion so Elias, it was clear that you really enjoyed those two weeks. Like that was probably the highlight of the first, you know, 18 or so years of your life, maybe. Um, what was the one thing that stood, stands out the most for you? One thing that stands out to me about uh, Bama Wilson? Mm -hmm. About the whole experience. Either something surprising you learned or something that you got to experience or, you know, see firsthand. I... I got to say, I really enjoyed the experience of uh, of uh, of taking what I what I learned, uh, coming up with a project idea, and then getting to actually like uh, bring it to fruition. Uh, I I think that that that's an amazing part of the experience, and it's definitely not something I could do anywhere else. In that case, I think majoring in science is the right choice for you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say congratulations on this opportunity. And um, also, I wanted to say I'm really excited to see where your future research goes, because I know you're at University of Ottawa now. Um, and I, don't, I can't stick around for much longer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have like a million things going on. But I really wanted to catch this because I know how excited you were about it. So, yeah. Thank you. And so do you have any other plans on future research you're going to do related to this topic? Or... Uh, I have no idea what, what research I'll get the opportunity to do, but mm -hmm. uh, what, whatever opportunities I'll get, I'll jump on because there's so many interesting things uh, in so many different domains. Uh, yeah, there's, I, I'm not, I'm not going to box myself in. It, there's so many cool things to do. Yeah, that's really smart. Honestly, I'm so excited to see how this goes for you. And um, yeah, it's just really cool to see you so enthusiastic about, about research. Thank and you. this is also perfect timing. So Emily, I'm going to keep you on for two more minutes because this <laughs> is the first of the John Abbott uh, Space and Astronomy Club exec with the most recent of the exec. And we're going from Ilias having given our August public event to we may have another public event in between, but our next big keynote is Emily's going to be presenting our Townsend Lecture on October 1st. And if everything goes well, she's going to be live from a moon simulation in Poland, which she is commanding. She is uh, currently a PhD student at Purdue University, and she's been chosen as commander for uh, a mission at a moon simulation. And she's gotten permission, if everything goes well, to zoom in and talk to us and share with us the experience of her first, I think, day and a half there when we will have the event.
Yep, it's I'm very excited. Um, not to obviously steal the spotlight. I totally did not want this to take away from No, no, we're going we're, because we're we're ending the recording part. So I okay. wanted to definitely hype our next public event, the Townsend Lecture, which is our keynote of the year. And so the fact that you were on with us made it perfect timing. And again, on behalf of all of us here at the RASC Montreal Center, Elias, thank you so much for sharing with us your two weeks at Mount Wilson. We can clearly see how much of an impact those two weeks have made on you, and we can't wait to see where your journey leads you next. Thank you. And I will stop recording now, and I will invite everybody who is still on the Zoom to unmute, to turn on your videos, and let's chat a little while. On behalf of the RASC Montreal Center, thanks again.